Hello, econ students, and welcome to our very first lecture for Principles of Microeconomics. I will be your instructor this semester. My name is Professor Edward Kung, and I am an economist who focuses on housing, real estate, and urban issues. Uh, but I've been teaching microeconomics for over seven years, um, so feel free to shoot me an email if you ever have any questions. So one thing I like to do at the start of every lecture is to give a list of the learning outcomes. These are the things that I hope you can take away from the lecture and that I think are important and that will serve you well in your life and in your future careers. These are also the things that you'll most likely be tested on, so make sure you pay attention to these and master these objectives. For our very first lecture, I'm going to be introducing the field of economics. And by mastering this lecture, you should be able to first explain what economics is and what economists do. Second, describe the method of observation, theory, and evidence that economists use to study economics. Three, discuss the role of data and evidence in economic studies. Four, explain the difference between a positive and a normative statement. And five, discuss the role of economic analysis in public policy. So for many of you, this is probably your first time receiving formal instruction in economics. So I think a good place to start would be to ask, what is the study of economics anyway? So economics is a beautiful subject that can provide us with many wonderful insights into humanity and society. But it's actually a difficult subject to pin down in terms of definitions. And that's because economics covers a variety of topics. Some people think economics is primarily about business, markets, and money. And while that is where the skills of an economist are in highest demand, economics also has a lot to say about other things like education, healthcare, politics, and even personal relationships. The word economy comes from the Greek word oikonomos, which means the manager of a household. Now, in ancient Greece, the household was a complex affair consisting of extended family members and also servants. And the head of the household, the oikonomos, was responsible for directing the roles and responsibilities of the people in the household and for managing the household's wealth. So one thing you could say is that the oikonomos was responsible for the allocation of the household's resources. In modern parlance, uh, the word economy has come to mean any system of production, trade, and consumption of goods and services. And so in other words, an economy can be thought of as a system for the allocation of resources. And so one definition of economics that many economists would give today is that economics is the study of how resources are allocated. So here's the definition of economics given by the American Economic Association. Economics can be defined a few different ways. It's the study of scarcity, the study of how people use resources and respond to incentives, or the study of decision making. It often involves topics like wealth and finance, but it's not all about money. Economics is a broad discipline that helps us understand historical trends, interpret today's headlines, and make predictions about the coming years. So as you can see, the first definition given by the AEA is that economics is about the study of scarcity and resource allocation. And that is indeed true, and that's what we talked about just now. But the second definition is that economics is about studying how people respond to incentives and how people make decisions. That's also true. Resources are allocated by people for the benefit of people. So an economy, which is a system of resource allocation, is nothing more and nothing less than the people within that system making decisions. So any study of resource allocation has to include the study of human decision making. And so that's why sometimes people define economics as the study of decision making and how people respond to incentives. So here's my favorite definition of what economics is, and it comes from the great 19th century economist Alfred Marshall. Marshall wrote that economics is the study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. That's a great definition, 
because it's the decisions of millions or even billions of people going about their daily lives that together give rise to the economy in which we live. And so a good economist should therefore be keenly interested in ordinary people. So now that we know what economics is, let's talk about what economists do. Economists conduct research, prepare reports, and formulate plans to address problems of an economic nature. These problems are often about money. So for example, an economist might be asked to predict the earnings impact of a merger between two companies, but it's not always about money. Economists might also be asked to study problems not explicitly about money, but about broader social impacts. So for example, an economist might be asked to evaluate the efficacy of charter schools relative to traditional public schools in raising educational achievement. To do their work, economists make ample use of economic and statistical data, so economists are therefore very well trained in data collection and data analysis. Economists work in a variety of industries, including government, and this table here shows the top five industries employing economists in the U.S. in 2019 along with their average annual salaries uh, for economists in the industry. So the largest employer of economists in the U.S. is the federal government, followed by two industries that primarily do research and consulting work, then followed by state and local governments. And the average annual wage for all economists in the U.S. in 2019 was about $116,000, right, which is well above the national average for all occupations. Now, something to keep in mind is that the data I showed you is averaged over all economists, uh, and that includes people with graduate degrees and those who are very well established in their careers. In fact, to have the title of economist at most organizations, you would usually have to have a, a graduate degree in economics, and a lot of the time, even a PhD. So as a college student, you might be more interested in knowing what the value of a bachelor's degree in economics is, right? regardless of what your future occupation might be. And it's true that many econ uh, economics majors will actually go on to do other things. Uh, some econ majors go on to become lawyers, others go into education, and some might even start their own businesses. So what this table is showing you is it's showing you the median annual wage for people based on what they majored in in college, uh, regardless of what they currently do for work. And the data comes from uh, data from 2013 through 2019. And so as you can see, economics majors lag behind some of the highly paid engineering professions, but they do do relatively well compared to other majors in business uh, or social science or the natural sciences. So economics is called a social science because economists try to study social phenomena such as human decision making or the allocation of resources using the scientific method. And there are many ways to describe what the scientific method is, but a simple way to break it down is into a threefold process of observation, theory, and evidence. So the study of economics begins by observing the world around you. And you might notice interesting phenomena that require explanation. So for example, uh, you might ask why historically have market-based economies performed better than centrally planned ones? Or you might ask why are governments more involved in some industries like healthcare and education than in other industries like computers or automobiles? Um, and for a more mundane but very practical example, why do houses in good school districts often sell for higher prices? So after you make your observations, the next step is to formulate a theory that can explain the observation. So perhaps market-based economies perform better than centrally planned ones because maybe individual buyers and sellers know more about what's good for them than a government planner does, right? And perhaps governments are more involved in some industries like healthcare and education because there are unique characteristics in those industries that make the private sector less efficient. And then perhaps houses in good school districts sell for more because parents value their children's education. Right? So these are all theories uh, that can be used to explain the observations that we observed. Now the third step in our scientific process 
is to look for evidence to either validate or refute our hypothesized theories. And this is often the hardest step, because in order to properly develop evidence to support a hypothesis, you first have to be able to rule out all the alternative explanations. Right, so in the housing example, how do we know if house prices are higher in good school districts because of the schools or because of something else about the district? Right, maybe neighborhoods with good schools are also safer, or maybe they have better access to amenities like parks and libraries. And so in order to rule out these explanations, we would only want to compare neighborhoods that are similar on everything else besides schools. But in order to do this, uh, we would have to have data on many different neighborhoods uh, and many different neighborhood characteristics. And so the process of finding evidence in economics is very heavily data dependent. And if in the end, we're not able to rule out the competing explanations, then we're not able to substantiate our theory. And if that's the case, uh, then we're either going to need to keep looking for better or more appropriate evidence, or we might have to go back to the drawing board and come up with another theory that fits the evidence better. So as you can see, the scientific method is an iterative process. New observations and new theories are always being made, and economists are always evaluating the evidence. Sometimes new theories are devised to explain old observations uh, as we become smarter and smarter at developing our ideas. Uh, and sometimes new evidence arrives that actually sheds new light and causes us to revisit old theories. So a crucial tool in the development of economic theory is what we call an economic model. An economic model is a simplified representation of an economic phenomenon which is being studied. And we'll be making use of many different economic models throughout uh, this course. And the key word when it comes to models is simplicity. The purpose of an economic model is to capture the main economic forces which are driving a phenomenon and intentionally leaving secondary issues out so that we can understand the main forces with greater clarity, right? Uh, if more realism is ever required, we can always make refinements to the model uh, after the main forces have been properly understood. Right, so let me give an example. Uh, later on in the course, we're going to learn that the price in a market is determined by supply and demand. Uh, in, order to, in, in order to understand supply and demand in markets, we're going to start by writing down a model of the market uh, with no taxation, right? So there's no taxes, even though in real life, markets are almost always taxed, right? Um, but we write down a model without taxation because we want to understand the basics of supply and demand without taxation so that we can understand the functioning of markets according to the most basic forces, that of the decisions of buyers and sellers on their own without an external government or third party acting in interference. Right? Only once we have understood these basic forces will we then consider what happens when we add the additional complication of taxation. And another benefit of writing down economic models is that the models allow us to make quantitative predictions with more precision than if we just conducted all of our analysis using words. Right? So by writing down a supply and demand model of a market, we can make quantitative predictions about what happens to the market price uh, when supply or demand changes in the market. And while the predictive accuracy of economic models is often criticized, uh, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly, I would still maintain that it's better to have some quantitative prediction using our models than to not have any quantitative predictions at all, right? And so the quantitative prediction of an economic model uh, should never be the only thing that a decision maker goes by in real life, but oftentimes it's a very helpful ingredient uh, for when a business or a government is trying to make a decision. So now let's talk about micro versus macroeconomics. Uh, the title of this course is Principles of Microeconomics, right? And that suggests a distinction between micro and macroeconomics, but so far I've been talking about economics as if it was all the same. Uh, the difference between micro and macroeconomics is the types of questions which is being studied. So microeconomists will study the decisions and interactions of individual people, households, and firms, right, with a key emphasis on individual. 
Uh, so for example, a microeconomist might study how individual households uh, choose how to allocate their budget, or how individual people decide how much education to obtain, or what happens when two uh, individual firms uh, choose to merge. Macroeconomists, on the other hand, uh, tend to study economy-wide phenomena, like the money supply or interest rates or aggregate price levels or unemployment rates, international trade flows, and things that are sort of um, at the economy-wide level as a whole. Now, historically, this distinction between micro and macro arose because of the different models and tools uh, which were used to study the two different types of questions. Right, microeconomic models uh, tended to focus on individual decision makers and often modeled the behavior of these decision makers uh, very explicitly and directly. Uh, macroeconomic models, on the other hand, have traditionally had to abstract away from individual decision makers um, for reasons of practicality, right? Because it would be too difficult to write down a model uh, where all 300 million Americans are making decisions on their own. So macroeconomists would make certain types of simplifications, like modeling the entire US economy as being controlled by one representative consumer or something like that, right? Uh, you could actually think about the distinction, uh, like the distinction between quantum mechanics and astronomy and physics, right? So quantum physicists study the behavior of individual particles, while astronomers study the behavior of planets and stars. Um, but even though planets and stars are made up of individual particles themselves, uh, the quantum forces that govern the particle behavior are not as important uh, at the cosmological scale, and other forces like gravity become more important. And so because of that, quantum physicists and astronomers use very different tools and methodologies. And it's very similar with micro and macro. We use very different tools and methodologies, and because of that, uh, traditionally, micro and macro economics have been taught in separate courses. I should say, though, that the distinction between micro and macro is getting fuzzier. Um, because today uh, our computers are much more powerful, macroeconomists actually are increasingly more and more able to build models that do take into account individual decision makers. And they're able to model explicitly how the separate decisions of uh, many, many different individuals together give rise to economy-wide phenomena. Uh, so to be a good macroeconomist, I would say that you would also have to have a strong foundation in microeconomics, okay? And um, for this reason also, most people uh, are required to take microeconomics before they can take macroeconomics. So most modern economists approach the field scientifically with a focus on explaining the observed phenomena and on using models to make predictions. But one thing is that it's pretty much impossible to avoid philosophical questions when you're studying economics. And that's because the question of resource allocation is very closely tied to questions about things like how society should be organized, how people should conduct their affairs with each other, uh, and how governments should lead their people. And so how one answers these questions is going to depend not just on what their understanding of economics is per se, but also on how they would answer deeper philosophical questions, like what is a just society, or what is the best way to live. So because there are both scientific and philosophical approaches to studying economics, economists have tried to distinguish between two different types of statements, what we call positive and normative statements. So a positive statement is a statement that is descriptive, meaning it's a statement that seeks to describe how things are or how things will be uh, in the case of when you're making a prediction. A normative statement, on the other hand, is a statement that is prescriptive, meaning it's a statement that seeks to tell you how things should be, okay, not, thing, not how things are or how they will be, but how things should be. And normative statements uh, necessarily involve a subjective value judgment. So let's look at an example. Here are two statements. Uh, the first statement is, raising the minimum wage will increase unemployment. And the second statement is, we should not raise the minimum wage. Okay, 
So which of these statements is positive and which is normative? All right, so the first statement is positive, right? Because it describes what will happen if the government raises minimum wage. It does not, however, say anything about whether the speaker thinks we should or should not raise minimum wage. So you might think that if minimum wage is gonna increase unemployment, then obviously it should not be raised, right? But that's not necessarily true. A person could agree with statement one, that minimum wage is gonna increase unemployment, but they might still want to raise the minimum wage if they think that raising the minimum wage will uh, reduce inequality, or maybe they think that there are other ways to deal with the increased unemployment that might result, right? So just because uh, you think one way about this positive statement doesn't necessarily um, say how you would think about the normative question of whether or not we should raise minimum wage. Now the second statement is normative because it says what the speaker thinks should happen, right? In this speaker's value judgment, uh, he thinks that the minimum wage should not be increased, right? And note that um, the speaker might think this whether or not they agree with the first statement, right? A person might think that minimum wage doesn't increase unemployment, but still oppose raising the minimum wage if, for example, they think that people and businesses should be free to make contracts with each other without any government interference, all right? And so economists are often called upon to make both positive and normative statements, but it's important to be able to distinguish between the two. And the reason that it's important is because an economist's expertise is primarily in answering the positive questions, right? Um, an economist's opinion is not necessarily more or less valid than anyone else's when it comes to normative questions, although they might be better informed. There's also more agreement among economists on positive questions than normative ones, right? Um, so the next time you see an economist on TV say something like, minimum wage increases unemployment, therefore we should not raise the minimum wage, uh, just keep in mind what part of that statement is a positive statement and what part of that statement is a normative statement. You should consider the positive statements very carefully because economists are usually coming from some type of evidence-based approach, um, but you should realize that it's possible to agree with someone on a positive statement and still disagree with uh, their normative conclusion. So now let's talk a bit about economics and public policy. Because of economics relevance to questions about how society should be organized uh, and how resources should be distributed, economists are often called upon to give public policy advice. And economists can do so from both positive and normative perspectives. As I mentioned already, an economist's training is primarily equipping them to answer the positive questions, but of course it's perfectly valid for economists to give their own normative perspectives as well. That being said, economists' advice uh, is not always followed by public policymakers, and that's because policymaking is a very complex business uh, that seeks to balance various diverse interests, right? Economists could be 100% agreed on a public policy issue and their advice still might not be followed if there are enough uh, interests that are against it, right? Um, but still, policymakers over time have shown that they do value the input of economists. And um, actually, the results of economic analysis, especially when the analysis is very solidly grounded in both theory and evidence, uh, have proven um, strong enough oftentimes to sway public opinion on different public policy issues. So now let me do something that should be kind of fun, which is talk about famous people uh, that you might not have known were economists, kind of, right? A picture here is Adam Smith, an 18th century British philosopher. Um, actually, he's famous actually for being an economist. He's often considered the father of modern economics. And we'll talk a lot more about Adam Smith later. Um, but right now, I actually wanna focus on some other individuals who you might not have known uh, thought and wrote extensively about economic issues. So the first of our historical figures is Aristotle. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who lived during the classical era of ancient Greece, and he's most well known for his contributions to logic and philosophy. But what's less known is that he also made contributions to economic thought as well. Aristotle wrote about topics such as private property versus communal ownership, 
the origin of money, and how to measure the worth of something. So here's an excerpt of Aristotle's writings on private property. He writes, Property should, in a certain sense, be common, but as a general rule, private, for when everyone has a distinct interest, men will not complain of one another, and they will make more progress, because everyone will be attending to his own business. So what Aristotle was saying here is that property in general should be privately owned, because otherwise, if the interests are being shared among many, then there are some who would not attend to the property well, and others are going to complain about them, and the conflict is going to result in less well-managed property overall. In fact, we're going to encounter this idea later of uh, private versus public ownership uh, in, our chap in our lecture on public goods and common resources. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is that Aristotle was primarily writing from a normative perspective, right? He was primarily concerned about how things should be, uh, but he did use some positive analysis in order to reach his conclusions. Uh, in fact, most economic analysis prior to the modern era was normative in purpose, and it's only in more modern times with the professionalization of economic research into its own distinct discipline that economics has uh, shifted towards a more primarily descriptive subject. Okay, our second historical figure is St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, Thomas Aquinas was an Italian Dominican friar, and he's widely considered to be one of the most influential theologians in the Roman Catholic Church. What he's most well known for is his theological treatise, the Summa Theologica, which dealt with matters of both God's relation to mankind and man's relation to man as well. And so naturally, when you're considering man's relation to fellow man, economic matters are going to come up. Uh, Aquinas' economic writings were primarily concerned about what types of economic transactions would be considered lawful or just, and what types of transactions would be considered unlawful or unjust or sinful. So here's an excerpt of Aquinas' writings on economics. A person may lawfully sell something at a profit, either because he has bettered the thing, or because the value of the thing has changed with the time or place, or on account of the danger he incurs in transferring the thing from one place to another, or again in having it carried by another. In this sense, neither buying nor selling is unjust. So Thomas Aquinas and other thinkers of his day thought that it was sinful to pursue profit for its own sake, right? How much have times changed? And because of that, they had a very low view of traders who would buy something only to sell it later for a higher price. But here we see Aquinas acknowledging a fundamental rule of economics, which is that the fair price of something is going to depend both on market conditions, right? Meaning the time and place, and on the costs borne by the seller, such as the risks, in bringing the item to the buyer or in the costs incurred in making improvements to it. And later in the course, we're going to see that price is indeed related to both market conditions and costs. And in fact, we're going to be able to develop uh, models that highlights the quantitative relationship. Finally, let's talk about Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus was a Polish mathematician and astronomer who is best known for developing the heliocentric theory of the universe, right? That is the theory that the Earth orbits the Sun, uh, something we take for granted today. But lesser known is the fact that Copernicus actually wrote about monetary theory of all things. Uh, he was asked by King Sigismund I of Poland to offer proposals for currency reform, uh, because at that time uh, in Poland there were three different currencies circulating. None of them had a standard weight, uh, and it was wreaking monetary chaos uh, on the country. And so in response to this, Copernicus wrote his Monete Cudende Ratio, which is often translated essay on the coinage of money. And here's an excerpt of his writings. The memory of man has not yet forgotten that grain and produce were bought in Prussia with a smaller number of coins while sound money was still being used. Now, however, as it is being debased, we experience a rise in the price of everything related to food and human consumption. 
Right, so Copernicus was actually giving an early explanation of what we now know is the quantity theory of money, which is that when excess money is created, then inflation, meaning rises in prices of everything, is the result. And so in Prussian Poland, the excess money was being created through the debasement of silver coins, meaning that new coins were being minted uh, using less actual silver content than the old coins, which allowed a greater amount of money, right, that is the coins, to be created from the same amount of silver. So it would be as if we were printing paper dollars today. Uh, and that resulted in inflation. Now, inflation is something that's typically covered in macroeconomics, so it's not a topic that we're really going to talk about in this course, uh, but you will learn about it um, if you go on to take a course in macroeconomics. All right, so I hope by now that your curiosity in economics has been piqued and that I don't have to convince you why studying economics would be a good idea. But in case you do need some more convincing, let me give you three additional reasons. So first, studying economics will help you understand the world around you better. Why is housing so expensive? Why does the public school system seem to produce poor outcomes? Why does my friend get paid more than me despite working less and having less education? So these are all questions that can be answered through the lens of economics. Sometimes the answers are going to be obvious, uh, but sometimes they're not. And sometimes you'll find the answers very surprising. Now, either way, uh, by having a framework to answer all these kinds of questions, you can begin to address some of the problems, uh, whatever they might be. Now, second, studying economics will help you make better decisions, right? Because if you understand the world around you better, then you can also make better and more accurate decisions. You might begin to make smarter investment choices with your money. Uh, you might become more effective in your workplace, um, especially as you move up the ranks in responsibility in an organization and you start to have to make more uh, bigger picture strategic decisions. You're going to find that having a working knowledge of economics uh, becomes more and more valuable as you start to make those bigger and bigger decisions. And finally, studying economics will help you form more informed opinions and to communicate those opinions more effectively, right? And this is really important because decision-making often happens in a group setting, right? So at home, decisions are made with your family. Um, at work, decisions happen within your team. And even in our democracy, in our country, decisions are made together with your fellow citizens. And so the ability to have an informed opinion and to communicate it effectively to others is really vital uh, to you being an effective contributor to decision making in a group environment, right? And so the hope is that with a deep understanding of economics, that you're going to have the tools to form a good opinion on your own about many different subjects, and that you will have the ability to communicate those opinions uh, both confidently and effectively using theory and evidence to back you up. Okay, so that's it for today's lesson. Thank you for sticking around to the end. And I hope that I've convinced you that studying economics is going to be both fun, useful, and very cool. And I will see you at the next lecture where we will talk about how people make decisions. Until next time.